If you've been looking for a newer certified Toyota, come be part of the team. With inventory arriving daily, we'll help you find a vehicle that works for your lifestyle and budget. We'll continue to ensure that your next buying experience is as safe and efficient as possible. Our service center is open with easy online scheduling and a quick clean process to get you back on the road safely. Head to teamtoyota.net and be safe, be strong, be a team. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Phillies Talk podcast presented by Team Toyota. Corey Seidman and Jim Salisbury here with you. And wow, you know, it's November 30th. It's Tuesday morning as we sit down uh, to record this, Jim. And there's just been so much free agent activity. Uh, It's almost been like the winter meetings these last few days, just in terms of the number of high profile players that have signed huge price tags on some of these contracts. Uh, You know, we've already seen some of the top free agents come off the board in the form of like Max Scherzer, Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon. But first off, before we start going through these contracts and talk about what the Phillies might have in the works, what have you thought about these last 48, 72 hours, just all these you know, nine-figure contracts being signed? You mentioned it's almost like the winter meetings. I, I think it's like the winter meetings you know, times 10, uh, the winter meetings on steroids. Um, there's some years we go to the winter meetings and there's not a lot of activity. Um, you know, the way free agent markets have developed – last in the last decade i mean guys used to like to have all their work done by christmas uh, players like to know where they're going by the holidays uh, now we're seeing the free agent season extend into spring training and we're quite aware of that in philadelphia we saw jake arietta sign with the phillies on i think march 12 a few years ago and bryce harper signed with the phillies on uh, i think it was march 1 three years ago so uh, it can it can go a long time but what we're seeing now is um, it almost feels like a mini trade deadline, at least from covering it. I'm, I'm feeling that trade deadline um, anxiousness uh, that comes along with covering it. And it's not always fun. <laughs> trade deadline stress and um, sleeping with your eyes open. And uh, it's, 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 uh, but you know, it's, it's added an element of excitement, certainly to the off season, um, intense, compacted excitement it's i guess you would say Corey, it's the um storm before the calm because we all believe that wednesday night um as the clock strikes midnight going into thursday the owners mlb owners management is going to impose a lockdown which is going to bring a freeze on transactions the cba collective bargaining agreement expires at that moment uh, two sides have been negotiating, you know, the uh, owners of the MLB uh, management, the owner, the owners and the players association been, been negotiating, but um, all indications are still quite far apart. A lot of issues here. And uh, it's hard to believe they're going to wrap them all up here in 48 hours. So we're probably looking at a, a lockdown late Wednesday night. And, you know, the action that we've seen the last couple of days just tells you guys want to know, where they're going. They don't want to risk a, a one day lockdown, a one month lockdown, a two month lock. I should say lockout. Um, they, they want to know where they're going. And then uh, when this thing ends and the smoke clears and there's a CBA, they'll have that taken care of. But also there's no way every free agent is going to come off the board. There's no way every roster is going to be constructed before the potential lockout with the one we think is coming. So, uh, I don't know how long it's going to last, but when the when transaction when the transaction freeze comes off, I'm expecting a flurry quite similar to the one we've seen the last few days. But we've seen some staggering, staggering amounts of money, and um, you know, one of my general thoughts is um, uh, when I look at the Phillies in particular is the Phillies expenditures for Zach Wheeler and Bryce Harper. Um, they look pretty good in comparison to some of the money being thrown around here the last few days. Yeah, Bryce Harper now has the 18th highest AAV, annual average value. He has the 18th highest among current major leaguers at uh, just under $24 million, just over $25 million, rather. Zach Wheeler, two spots below that at 20th. So 18th and 20th for the NL MVP 
and the Cy Young runner up. Those are pretty decent prices. And when you look at the amounts that some of these guys have signed for, like the, the, the two that stick out the most are Corey Seager, 10 years, $325 million with the Rangers, and Max Scherzer, just the insane yearly salary. It's $130 million over three years from the Mets, who obviously felt a little desperation uh, in yeah. going to sign Scherzer. And there were indications that he wanted to stay out West. So they probably overpaid a little bit in getting him, but not good news for the Phillies. I know he's going to be 38. There's the chance that Scherzer could fall off at any point, but this past season statistically was pretty close to the best of his career. Yeah. It's a staggering, staggering amount of money. Um, especially when you, frame it around AAV, um, $43 million per season <laughs> for a guy. He'll turn 38 next year, right? He's 37. I think he turns 38 during the season. Um, maybe we can check that. But uh, a staggering amount of money, when you frame it around AAV and you take into consideration that the previous high on AAV, average annual value of a contract, was Garrett Cole at $36 million. So, I would say, you know, like a $7 million jump almost dwarfs that AAV or comes close to that. It's a, it's a huge amount of money. Um, he's had a few nagging injuries the last couple of years, but he's still a great, great, great pitcher. Any day of the week, he's the best pitcher in baseball. Um, great control, great strikeout stuff, a great, great competitor. I love watching him attack hitters. Um, but I think you made the right – kind of read there it reflects some desperation on the Mets part um their owner is a very deep pocketed guy Steve Cohen the richest owner in baseball he ain't going to be worried about that luxury tax he's trying he, he's, his team was in first place probably for the majority of uh 2021 in the National League East and slipped to third place um late in the season they they lost to Grom uh, but, you know, they're trying to get back on the map. They're trying to get back on the map in a hurry. Uh, they, you know, remade their outfield, looking to win the World Series. You don't make moves like that without, you know, coming across this. We're trying to win the World Series, and that's what that owner has promised, and that's what he's trying to do. Um, and, uh, you know, DeGrom was out from about early July last year with a bad elbow. He's supposed to be healthy. There's risk. Both of them have some age. Both of them have high odometers. Uh, but if they have those two guys at the top of the rotation, DeGrom and uh, Scherzer, since 2018, they are number one and number three, respectively, in the RA and the major leagues. If they have those two guys at the top and they stay healthy, that is a, a rotation built to dominate in the month of October. So uh, they got two great ones. And, you know, their numbers against the Phillies combined, uh, DeGrom and Scherzer, they have five Cy Youngs between them. Uh, and their numbers against the Phillies and against a lot of teams, I need to point out, are, are dazzling. So not the best news in the world for the Phillies that Scherzer's back in the NL East. I mean, he made his last start at Citizens Bank Park in July, then was traded over to uh, the Dodgers. And we're like, you know, that's hey, a good move, getting him out of the division. Well, he's right back here, uh, and he's a tough guy to beat. Uh, you know, we watched this year, uh, in June and July, he and Zach Wheeler. And Zach Wheeler, second in the Cy Young, great pitcher. He and Zach Wheeler matched up three times uh, in July, in June and July of 21. And the uh, Nationals, Scherzer was still with the Nationals. They won all three of those games. Scherzer won all three of those games. Outpitched Wheeler in all three of them. Two of them were real classic pitcher stools. Um, so, um, like I said, not great news that Max Scherzer is still uh, in the NL East, uh, at least for the Phillies. Uh, but the Mets are certainly happy they have him. Maybe now they can go out and find a manager. <laughs> Well, yeah, so that's 10 straight years of Max Scherzer in the NL, at least minus those two months that he spent with the Dodgers. And so, Jim, a lot of Phillies fans are upset right now that there's been all this free agent activity and the Phillies haven't yet made any moves. But when I look at this list of guys who have signed, right, I've made a list today of like all the, the, the guys who have signed for at least $20 million. The only players who kind of fit the direction the Phillies were expected to go in in terms of needs – would be the center fielders, right? Like a guy like Starling Marte, who signed for $78 million over four years with the Mets, he's off the board, that hurts. Or, you know, Byron Buxton signed that $100 million extension with the Twins. He was a potential trade target to play center field. But the rest of these guys who have signed, the Phillies weren't going to go after one of those three hundred or two hundred million dollars shortstops like Corey Seager or Javi Baez. Marcus Semyon got one hundred seventy five million dollars. Again, that wasn't a need. Some of these top tier starting pitchers 
Well, starting pitching, if you look at the Phillies roster, is one through four pretty good, right? You, you know, you could make the case that when Zach Eflin returns, they have a full rotation. They'll need some depth, but I don't think they were going to be going after Robbie Ray at five years, $115 million, or Kevin Gosman over $100 million. So, I mean, what do you make of that? Do you think that a lot of their targets have dried up, or do you still see some some guys out there for the Phillies that were on their wish list? Oh, I see plenty of guys that were on their wish list or remain on their wish list. I mean, you know, I, I think they did their due diligence on a guy like uh, Marte um, for the simple reason, you know, he fits you in two areas you're looking for, center field uh, and, you know, offense, uh, whether you hit him in the middle or bat him closer to the top. Um, but, you know, I mean, the Mets were very aggressive in, in getting him. Uh, he's another player with uh, a high odometer um, reading. Um, but, you know, they still need to do something in center field. They still need to do something in Phillies in left field. Um, a guy like Kyle Schwarber is a definite target. And I think he's been a target for quite some while, uh, quite some time here, really since the beginning of the off season. Um, you know, Dave Dombrowski at the GM meetings reiterated what he said in early October that he wants a big bat in the middle. And he said he preferred a left-handed bat to play in left field. Um, didn't rule out a right-handed bat, but preferred a left-handed bat. Also preferred someone without the qualifying offer. Well, all of those kind of uh, indicators bring you to Kyle Schwarber, and they definitely have interest in him. Kevin Long is their new hitting coach. He has a good rapport with Schwarber dating to the time in Washington last season. Uh, so they are engaged with Schwarber. They would like to, they would like to land him, but so would other teams. You never know what's going to happen. Um, they've also made the bullpen a priority, and they need kind of like. They need quantity and quality out there. They've kind of addressed a lot of quantity issues with some waiver claims. Um, they are involved. Uh, in fact, on, late on Monday night, we're uh, quite involved with Corey Kniebel, who has time as a closer. In fact, was an all-star closer with Milwaukee. Uh, and that seemed to be pretty far down the road um, from my take on it. And maybe that still could get done. Um Maybe that will get done here before the before the lockout, and uh, he would be a guy to add to that back end. Maybe consider him as a closer, uh, but I, I think you'll, they're still going to be out there looking for a closer um, and looking for more arms in that bullpen. They they did not bring back Hector Neris. Uh, they were outbid for, by for him by Houston, uh, so there's still plenty of work to do out in that bullpen. Plenty of names uh, available and will remain available through this lockout. Uh, as to in relation to the Phillies' needs. Uh, I just – I don't think they're going to be in a hurry like a Conforto. He would be a nice guy to have maybe in left field. Um, Nick Castellanos, I think he would kill Citizens Bank Park. But I don't think they're in a hurry to surrender draft picks, uh, high-round draft picks. I'm not saying they won't, but that could be a deterrent to uh, – those free agents because they have a quality for it, qualifying offer attached to them. Well, if the Phillies' main offseason move is Kyle Schwarber, do you think that they're going to be able to get enough better? I mean, I know that there are other areas to target closer uh, beyond Knabel, even if they bring him in as a potential setup man or closer. Uh, you know, I'm just starting to wonder because when you look at like the center field market, a lot of these guys aren't like needle movers. I mean, there's there's Chris Taylor who plays all over the field and can play center field. There's Chris Bryant who can play center field, but probably won't for the bulk of his next contract, I wouldn't think. So you just start to wonder, like, with the improvement the Mets have made, the Braves just won the World Series. No, the Nationals and Marlins are going to be pretty bad in 2022. But, like, is there a pathway to the Phillies to improve as much as they need to this offseason? I, I don't know. I mean, on, on paper – that's probably not enough of a needle mover, but I think more would follow. I do think they're going to get a, um, a more significant bullpen arm. I really believe they need one. Um, uh, and, you know, they're going to do what they can in center field. And I, I don't I don't rule out Dombrowski, you know, his track record. He likes big trades. I don't rule out him doing something like that. I look at the way they've built some catching depth. Maybe they could uh, part with one of their minor league catching prospects. Um I don't see them parting with Bryson Stott. Um, would they listen on a, a guy like um, Alec Bohm? I, I don't know. Uh, the, right now the intention is to play him at third base, but I think they're willing to discuss just about anything. 
Um, I think they would discuss Aaron Nola. Um, depending on what you get back, depending on how they could, you know, plug a, a hole in the rotation that that, that would create. Um, there would be a $20 million um, free up there that you could use. Um, I don't think Kniebel, if he comes, I don't think Schwarber, if he comes, is the last move this team makes. I think Dombrowski knows that he needs to do more to close up that gap between him and the Braves and the hard-charging um, New York Mets. And, and don't rule out the, the uh, improving Miami Marlins, who have a lot of good arms. Um, I just think there's still – we're really focused on these last couple of days. There's a lot of action, a lot of headlines. It's fun. But there's a lot of off-season left, and there's time to even churn this thing once the season gets going. Dabrowski has a history of that, um, making moves to the deadline. They need – the answer to your question is, you know, do they do – will they have done enough to close the gap? The answer to your question is that they need they need to fill some holes here, and then they need those guys to play well. They need their existing core to play well. Um, you got to come out of the gate, and uh, you can't get buried early. And give you give your management a chance to make some moves mid season. Um, though it's been a quiet few days here, um, there's still a lot of off season left. That said, on paper, yeah, they look like a third place team, kind of what they looked like last year in the off season. Um, so they need to fill in around the edges because they had the MVP and the runner up in the Cy Young. So there are some very significant reasons or, or pieces on this team. Um, it's it's going to be what the front office does the rest of the way here. And then ultimately how those guys come together, how they perform. I think we all like that starting rotation. If Eflin comes back healthy, Noel is still here as a rebound season. Um, I'm still a believer that so much starts with your starting rotation, and there are reasons to like that starting rotation. Ranger Suarez, Gibson um, should be a solid guy at the, at the back end. Um, but, you know, we'll see. There's a lot of offseason left. I'm not going to be fooled by, you know, a few days of, of flurry here. Yeah. There's still going to be plenty of opportunities to, to move this thing forward, and it's incumbent on this front office to do that. So you don't think the Phillies feel any pressure to get things done before December 1st, before the potential lockout at 11.59 p.m. Wednesday? I'm sure they do because I'm sure they're hearing it from the free agents that want to get something done and have other suitors. And sure, they're not – their head's not in the sand. They know the Mets are – what they're doing up there. But you can't be reactionary to the Mets making big splashes. You have to do what's right for your – ball club. And I think Kyle Schwarber would be right for this ball club. I think he could potentially destroy Citizens Bank Park offensively. I mean, he's, he's not, not going to be a gifted defender, but um, they have made it clear that they would sacrifice some offense, uh, some defense, I should say, for more offense at that left field position. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think a guy like that would be a nice fit. I think Knievel would be a nice fit. I just think you can't stop there, though. You can't stop there. So, um, as far as, as pressure, um, I just think the pressure is probably just wanting to get these guys in the fold, uh, and get them away from other people, lock them down in, in your uniform, just because the longer they linger out there, the chance they could end up somewhere else. So, um, you know, I just, I don't think you can respond to headlines. I mean, look at last year. I remember writing about it. I, I, I was guilty of it. Um, the Mets traded for Francisco Lindor, bright lights, electric player. I mean, what a talent. And, and I was like, wow, this is a, a needle moving, uh, to use your expression, this is a needle mover for the Mets. And, and it has impact on what happens in Philadelphia. Well, he did not have a great year. And um, when, when the season played out, the Mets were a third-place club. So uh, it's it's nice to win the offseason. It's 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 and you just got to play good during the season, and that's where you really need to win. And um, off seasons can really help you <laughs> when you add good talent, but they still need to go out and play good. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, think back to last off season, all the players that made those big headlines, and then the two best free agent acquisitions by far turned out to be one-year deals for Marcus Semien and Robbie Ray, who both went to Toronto, vastly outperformed their deals, and ended up signing both uh, contracts over $100 million. The Rangers, by the way, 
committing $500 million to their middle infield between Marcus Semien and Corey Seager. Just crazy wow. money being spent. Jim, thinking about center field potential trade targets, Cedric Mullins of the Orioles, there's some rumblings that maybe he's available. There's Whit Merrifield out in Kansas City who can play center, second base, right field. He's a perennial trade to, uh, candidate. There's Brian Reynolds in Pittsburgh that people have talked about a little bit. Uh, anybody um, anybody else that I'm missing that you can think of? I mean, I just wonder with, with some of those guys like Baltimore, even if Cedric Mullins is available, would they want an Aaron Nola in exchange or would they be looking for like a younger package of prospects? And if they're looking yeah. for prospects, does catching make sense to them with them having uh, Adley Rutschman, their, their top prospect who's a catcher? You know, a lot of different factors. I think they'd be looking for younger and less expensive than a guy like Aaron Nola. I mean, uh, I mean, Kermar and uh, Jackie Bradley Jr. are probably trade guys to keep an eye on. Um, you know, um, I remember when Cedric Mullins came into Citizens Bank Park, I think in September, I'm looking at him and like, that would be a really nice guy to get. But, you know, he's young enough where the Orioles could kind of keep him and, and try to build around him. And if they do move him with, I don't know how much control he has left. I'm sure he has a good amount. Um, you know, it's, it's going to really cost you. And uh, I don't know that the Phillies have uh, the depth in Major League, you know, that that, that come that close to the major prospect um, to get something done. Reynolds is a very intriguing guy, which who I think you'd have to think about uh, maybe parting with a little bit of your future uh, if you could get into that. But He's got like three or four years of control. His, his price tag, you know, in terms of what you'd have to give him, is going to be immense. I mean, the or, uh, the uh, Pirates would put a big price tag, uh, a, a big, uh, you know, big number on him in terms of what they get back in, in prospects and whatnot. So, but I'm sure the Phillies are investigating every one of those um, potential deals and seeing what it would cost and how they would match up, um, because you know, center field as a whole, uh, boy. You, at this stage of the game, it really shouldn't be a hole. You drafted two center fielders in, in recent years, in 16 and, what, 17 with Moniak and uh, and Hazley, um, and neither one of them um, have seized the opportunity or proven to, you know, be what you're looking for in terms of uh, a player to put in there full time. So that those – the, this, those drafts have really hurt them because that was a position that you th thought maybe you thought you should have filled th through through the draft with those two with those two uh, picks even even left field so um, their need for outfield help has really illuminated their draft issues. They also parted ways this week with another player who was in that center field mix for several several years and Roman Quinn uh, yeah. just wasn't able to stay healthy enough. Uh, the tools, some of the tools were there. He looked like he could be a valuable everyday player if he could stay healthy based on the defense and the speed, but just unable to put it together and 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 sustain it over a long term while being on the field. What did you think of that move? Was that just, you know, 40-man roster considerations and thinking about moves ahead? Yeah, yeah. They added uh, more bullpen depth. So they're going the quantity route in the bullpen and hoping that a little bit of quality emerges. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a bad – uh, thought because we've seen it happen before relievers can come out of nowhere and have a great season so one of these four guys that they've claimed or added to the trade in, in the case of nick nelson could could blossom give you a good year give you a good year and a half um clearly roman was the last guy on the 40 that's why he comes off um you know his expiration date he's probably reached his expiration date in philly um and uh, it's not for hard work or lack of hard work, I should say. The guy works, he just didn't stay healthy and had a, a series of anywhere from minor to debilitating injuries, concussion. Uh, he ripped up a ligament in his hand, his thumb. Uh, he tore ACL twice. He had a quad uh, tear. Um, the kids had a ton of injuries. Uh, and it's too bad because a lot of talent great kid, real hard worker. Um, it just because, got to the point where, you know, you couldn't rely on him uh, to stay healthy. So, you know, I, my guess is, I mean, he was going to be non-tendered anyway this week. So they kind of just uh, expedited that process. Um, my guess is he clears waivers, becomes a free agent, and, and maybe opts for a change of scenery. Uh, I guess he could come back on a minor league deal. 
Um, but I, I probably think it's best for both parties that maybe he explores something elsewhere. Um, he's not old, still relatively young, still has those great tools. He's just – he's missed so much development time because of injuries. And then when he's got a chance to play, he's been inconsistent – hasn't really seized opportunities that were given to him. And I think a lot of that just goes back to he didn't amass enough enough reps along the way because of the injuries, didn't ma- amass enough reps to to maximize or reach that potential. So uh, not surprised he, he's he been let go here. Um, Odubel Herrera was let go. So just a very unsettled outfield picture. Um, they had some raw materials, and, and none of it really clicked. Jim, there have also been reports that MLB is seeking to expand the playoff field as part of the next collective bargaining agreement. Uh, some of the details were potentially a 14-team playoff field where you'd have the three division winners with the best team in each league getting a first-round bye, kind of like in the NFL where the top seed gets a bye. And then the other two division winners would get to pick which wild card team they'd face out of the four wild card teams with the remaining two wild card clubs facing each other. A couple questions. One, do you think that this will happen? Uh, two, if it does happen, do you think it changes the equation for teams in the Phillies position? Because, yeah, they want to end this playoff drought, but if the path to the playoffs is a little easier, maybe it means you don't have to spend as much. I know for the Phillies that just getting in is extremely important and they need to improve, but I just wonder if this kind of changes um, how teams allocate resources this offseason if they think that an expanded playoff field is happening. I mean, we saw what it meant in 2020 when eight teams in each league made it. I think that's the big fear of the players association that teams are going to change their modus operandi and, you know, Hey, I only have to be, you know, seventh best team to get in and keep my fans happy and say I was a postseason team. So, you know, we can spend, uh, we can keep our spending here and be just good enough instead of taking our spending to a, another level and be really good and firmly in the playoffs. So I think that's a fear of the union. I'm not sure they will go for that. I, I like it at 10 teams. I like it to be a tough ticket. I like it to be hard to get into. Um, and I'm not sh- I'm not sure that goes through. We, um, for the simple reason, as I mentioned, I'm not sure the union would go for it. I mean, I think in some ways it would be really exciting. Pick your own, pick your own opponent, pick your own wild card opponent, um, more teams in. Um, you never know. The 14th seed could win the World Series because there's so much randomness in, in postseasons. Um, I mean, we've seen it. We've seen wild card teams win the World Series before. But I personally like it to be a tough ticket. Um, and I like it at 10 teams where it is. Um, but money rules the day in this game. And, you know, the networks like more postseason teams, um, you know, you're going to sell more tickets, uh, make more money, and it'll be it'll be more of a show in the postseason. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if they expanded, but it also wouldn't surprise me if they kept it the way it is because, um, you know, one thing I think the union is very concerned about, and there's a lot of things, but is, you know, there's been a drop in the average salary, Um I know we, we see these huge contracts and we see, you know, big market teams spending more, um, <clears throat> but they want to see that middle ground, you know, close up a little bit. Teams are really valuing young players. The union wants to see those young players get compensated and they want to see teams spend on the bulk of their roster. Um, So if a team is incentivized or I can be the 14th best team and only spend X amount of dollars and and still get to the playoffs, not sure the union goes for that, but there's just a whole litany of um, issues that they need to work out in this, in this new CBA. So I I don't know where that's going to go. Like I said, it would make money and that always kind of rules the day, but I kind of like, I like it to be hard to get into the postseason. I don't want to diminish the importance of the regular season any amount. So we'll see. We'll keep an eye on it. The only aspect of that, you know, proposed uh, playoff reformatting that I like is the idea of the one seed getting a buy because it would, you know, it would bring back the idea of actually getting an advantage for winning 107 games 
108 games like the Giants just did. You know, yeah. you win all those games and you still pretty much are in the same position as everybody else. Yeah, you have the home field advantage, but it's in a short series. You get one additional home game. I don't know if that's a, a big enough advantage for a team that dominated for six straight months, but that's just me. I, I just value the regular season a little bit more. But, man, what a week in baseball between the player movement, the CBA that's on the horizon, the discussions that uh, the two sides have to figure out. We'll be back with you later this week to break down what the Phillies did or did not do. Hopefully some moves on tap for the Phils this week. He's Jim Salisbury. I'm Corey Seidman. Thanks for listening.